Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Alan Lumsden. I'm the chair of CV Surgery here at Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. Uh, I'm really honored uh, to be joined by Dr. Patel. Uh, Dr. Patel is one of the cardiac surgeons at University of Michigan, and he gave a great talk last night on malperfusions related to dissections, and this morning shared his experience with uh, thoracic dissections, in particular thoracic endograft. So thank you for coming. We really appreciate you taking time to come down here and educate us. You're a heart surgeon. How did you get into the endograph world and, and why did you have this vision that this was something that you needed to be involved with? So actually when I was a general surgery resident, um, my very first rotation in general surgery was on vascular surgery and I'd never seen really any of it before. Um, and I took a liking to vascular surgery and um, actually ended up uh, being at an institution where a lot of the early endovascular revolutions occurred. And I could see the, the uh, applicability to a lot of what cardiac surgery did. Because it was around that time also that a lot of percutaneous interventions started occurring in, in uh, coronary um, artery disease, for example. Um, and, I, and, and I think that with the interest that um, I had in cardiac surgery, it just almost became sort of an extension of it. And uh, over time, uh, sort of my, my vision of what I thought cardiac surgery would be is one that was a very natural extension of what vascular surgery was. And towards the end of that time, I was actually given a book called Band of Brothers. Um, which was edited by one of the faculty at, uh, at Rochester named James DeWeese. James DeWeese was uh, in charge of both cardiac and vascular surgery at the time. And as I leafed through that book, uh, it was very evident that a lot of the specialty of vascular surgery was started by uh, people who did both. So uh, the genetics were very similar between the two. And I just happened to be at a place where endovascular was starting to uh, take off, and um, it sort of translated very easily to what I was interested in. So you mentioned that you took time out and went to the Cleveland Clinic to work with Roy Greenberg. And for those of you who don't know who Roy Greenberg is, Roy was a vascular surgeon, really one of the pioneers of stent grafting, branch stent grafting. Um, unfortunately, we lost him several years ago, uh, but really transformed the field. So how'd you do that? How'd you take time out and, and go learn this stuff? So I, I was actually very fortunate. So the uh, faculty, so I was a very junior faculty member. I'd been out of um, training for two years, I believe. And around that time, my section chief, Ed Beauvais, approached me and said, we see this uh, revolution coming. And within our group, it makes sense that you start thinking about this. So I want you to go find a, a place to go train, and we will support you during your time. So it was actually very easy. At the time, uh, vascular surgery was undergoing a revolution. Um, there were very few surgeons who were training in endovascular techniques, but that was going to be changing. And when I started exploring it, there were only three Society of Vascular Surgery um, accredited training programs, one of which was the Cleveland Clinic. It just so happened that about half of the people at the Cleveland Clinic were Rochester trained or faculty. And so it was very easy for me to pick up a phone and call up Roy, who was basically a resident who was a year ahead of me. And I ended up being, I think, the first cardiac surgeon that was trained in endovascular in that track. So it's very interesting that uh, you keep coming back to the environment in Rochester, and it's had a huge impact. In fact, uh, many of the people at Cleveland Clinic, Ken Norio, Roy, um, several others, came from Rochester. How, how is that environment created there, that they produce such innovative people? Well, I think, first of all, the, the, um, the environment was very supportive to multidisciplinary care. So the other thing that I saw when I was there as a, uh, as a resident was there was a period of time where the, the departments or the sections of vascular surgery 
and interventional radiology who was doing a lot of kind of endovascular work, I believe they financially merged. Mm -hmm. So I had seen that occur during that time frame. I also saw because of um, uh, Roy's initial interest in pursuing this endovascular um, therapy, he was one of, he in his uh, typical research year of your vascular fellowship decided to pursue some time in Sweden with the interventional radiologist. And I, I had just come back from uh, my research experience and Roy was the first year fellow and I'd heard that he had gone to Malmo to train in um, the train in endovascular techniques and he came back. So my last three years of general surgery I saw him do that. I saw the next fellow, um, the next couple of fellows do that as well. And by my chief residency year, um, Dick Green, who was the section head, uh, was basically, if I remember right, spending every Friday in the angio suite learning endovascular techniques. So it became very obvious that um, I needed to acquire that if I wanted to do aortic disease, which, you know, spans sort of multiple boundaries. And it ended up being that I, I came to a place where there was a very well um, oiled kind of thoracic vascular practice within cardiac surgery. And I toyed around for a little bit about whether I would need to do a year in vascular surgery, secure boards in this, um, to be able to participate. But it just so happened that I got a job at uh, Michigan and then my boss came up and said, why don't you go do this? So it was just, I happened to be in the right place at the right time. Nothing to do with me. So paint the future of aortic interventions over the next five years. What do you, th what do you think is going to happen? I mean, has, is it too much endo? You know, the word endo exuberance is sometimes being utilized. I can tell you that I've been here long enough now that I'm seeing a lot of patients who've got inferino grafts coming back with expanded aneurysm. The device is fine, but the aorta's falling apart around them. And do you think the same thing's going to happen in the thoracic aorta? But I think it depends on what you're treating. Um, and I think the biggest difference between the abdominal aorta and the thoracic aorta is the range of pathology that you see in the thoracic aorta is very, very different. Um, typically in the inferenal, it's just uh, degenerative. So I think if it's not applied correctly, it may have some consequences. And certainly when we looked at our series, as I described this morning, there is a difference between the type of pathology and the success rates for TVAR. Um, I think that over the next five years, I'm hopeful that the devices will continue to improve. Um, paradigms about how you should treat will uh, evolve along with these improving devices. So I think partnering with engineers and as well um, industry to develop newer devices for people who are vested in the treatment of aortic pathology will actually go a long way in improving the access to uh, less invasive technology. And as, as I talked about this morning, you know, aneurysm surgery is really done to improve life expectancy. And if you look at it, um, you have to continue reducing the risk associated with it. Um, and part of that includes the morbidity of an open approach. Thank you very much. Thanks again for thank uh, talking to us, and thank you for coming down here and visiting with us. Thank you very much.